I knew who I was supposed to marry. Really? Yeah, it was my first cousin. Oh. Yeah, even closer. So his mom is my dad's full sister, and his dad is my dad's half brothers, meaning his mom and dad are half siblings. So I'm related very close to them because. Oh my gosh. If you, sorry, this is going to confuse you, but if your parents are half siblings, that means your dad is your uncle, right? Because your your yeah. mom's brother is your uncle, right? <laughs> so that means your parents are your aunt and uncle. <laughs> oh my gosh. So oh basically, gosh. if I had kids with him, I'd have kids with like 12 toes or whatever. Like that would have not <laughs> been a good thing. Hey guys, my name is Shalise Anzola and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're listening only and you want to see our faces, go to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. You can like, subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss any episodes. This is such an exciting one. I'm just going to jump right into it because... My friends, this is the most requested guest that we have ever had on Cults to Consciousness. If you are one of the people who wanted this collaboration, let us know in the comment section below. Then I will just put a few of the comments requesting this person on the screen here. Is it really? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yes. I'm like, what? That's the first I'm hearing of that. <laughs> you have been the most requested guest and for a good reason. You have, so I normally don't talk directly to you in the intro. I'm just going to do that now. <laughs> Amanda, you have your own YouTube channel where you talk about escaping polygamy. You're on a TV show called Escaping Polygamy mm -hmm. and you actually helped women and men get out of these groups. You are specifically from the Kingston clan in Salt Lake City. It is a fundamentalist branch of the Mormon church, which I grew up in, just the regular Joe Blow uh, <laughs> mainstream Mormon <laughs> church. And we are going to go deep into all of this. So welcome officially to the show, Amanda Ray. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, of course. <laughs> We wanted to discuss specifically today the coercion and the forced polygamy. So I know there's so much we could get into with that. Uh, you were part of this group, you know, firsthand and you help people escape it. So people have just been dying to hear this conversation between us and I'm so excited to get into it. So before we go into that specifically, for people who aren't aware of the Kingston clan, can you just give a super brief overview as to where they came from and kind of like the the broad strokes of what you dealt with growing up? Okay, yeah. Um, I think this episode is going to be really long <laughs> if, we're, if we're diving into the history and everything, but that's a good thing. The group started in 1935. That's when the we like officially were... Um, the Davis County Cooperative Society. It started as a little like society and then it kind of turned into more of a religion because it was like at the time of the Great D Depression. We, we hear about all this in order history in church, but when I was born, it was in the 90s and I was born into the second wife's family. So my mom had married my dad at 17, but she the first wife was her full sister. Crazy. I know. The thing that blows my mind is like she wasn't born in the group. Can you imagine marrying your sister's husband, not being born right. in a polygamous group? Like, I just can't even imagine ever doing that. But yeah, she had joined, married my dad. It was very like hush hush secretive. Um, I didn't even know he was my dad because we were of the second wife. So the first wife's kids were allowed to call him dad. We were not allowed to call him dad. I remember asking him. Because I, I was like, who's, who's my dad? Oh my <laughs> like, where, well, who is this guy that keeps coming around to the house? So I had no idea. And even on my birth certificate, I have a fake name as the father. His, it's Kyle Graham. Oh my gosh. It's completely fake. I've never met a Kyle Graham before. <laughs> I'm in the second oldest of 10 kids that my mom ended Whoa. up having. But so at a very young age, I'm being lied to. I'm being manipulated. I'm being coerced. But also on top of all of that, like polygamy was very driven into the teachings. So I was put into the private school. They have a school called Enzyme Learning Center that's in Utah mm. that all of the Kingstons go to. And so from a very young age, they're teaching you to start praying about your direction on who you're supposed to marry and to know that you are going to be entering, either being a first wife or entering into a polygamous relationship. Yeah. And you just don't question it. Like that number one thing was you... 
you don't question God. <laughs> Questioning God is a sin. So you follow the chain of command. And all of us women just knew that we would one way, one day we would be living polygamy. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation with a few people from fundamentalist Mormonism, uh, two different groups. So Calvin, he says, hey, by the way, I know you guys are friends. Yeah. <laughs> we did an episode with Calvin and he was from The Work. You mm -hmm. were from The Order. Mm -hmm. We did an episode with Jude, who was from the Warren Jeffs official FLDS sect. So they're all slightly different. And am I correct in saying that even your group branched off from the same when the split happened and Warren Jeffs went over here and then the order or the work went over here and then were you part of that split? It is interesting. I always thought that like when the LDS uh, abolished polygamy or whatever, that all of these groups huddled together and then decided who was going to be the next leader and then couldn't figure it out. Yeah. But I think it's it's they kind of just split off into different like areas because mm -hmm. Calvin Calvin came from the FLDS, right? They, right? His history comes from that and is a branch from that. Us, I think we kind of just started in 1935 and then we do have some members who left the FLDS and joined. Mm. So the history of it is always really weird because what they taught us was, oh, the first leader got the keys from Heavenly Father when he went up into the mountain and he was fasting and he was given the keys that this is the true church on earth. So that's the story we were told. But I think there's way more history that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a lot of people that left the LDS church that were just trying to find... I don't know, community in the polygamy aspect. Because our group started with the consecration because they, they believe that the LDS church has fallen because they, mm -hmm. they lack the true teachings of consecration and polygamy, which I don't know if, if the LDS church had more consecration that they were doing back then, and then they decided to do less. But our group was like, oh, the LDS church only does 10%. We give our all to the Lord. Interesting. I don't know if they, you guys changed. So even that word, like growing up as a Mormon, like, yeah, consecration, that definitely rings a bell. But as far as what that actually means in works... To us, it was like you you guys, LDS Church. Sorry, I know it's not you because no, you're out you can now. Do, it's easier just to do that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we would trash talk the LDS Church oh because gosh. for multiple... Yeah, it was like, you know how like the two high schools that hate each other yeah, was like that? the rivalry. <laughs> but... <laughs> Exactly. Even though we came from Joseph Smith, yeah. but we hated the LDS church because uh, they couldn't handle it. They fell they away it. from it, from the true teachings. Mm. Exactly. And so our consecration wasn't just signing our... So we had to sign 10% forms every year, but we also signed inventory forms. So that meant I remember writing down everything that I had of value. So if I had a guitar that I would have to write down, okay, this guitar is worth $200. My bed's worth what? this much money. You'd have to write an inventory of everything you had and consecrate it to the Lord so that if... <gasps> So it's not yours, it's the Lord's. Oh. So technically the leadership, if they wanted, could take it if they if they wanted to. Right. And then on top of that, you have your bank account in the order, in the group. Okay. So um, they're automatically taking out that 10%. And honestly, 99% of the time, they're taking more than 10%. And you just oh, don't know because what? there's no paper trail. Uh-huh. This is blowing my mind. I didn't have an app on my phone that showed my banking. <laughs> you didn't? No. Okay. So for those who aren't aware, in the Mormon church, it's required that you give 10% of your income to the church. And it's meant to be like, your money goes to help poor people and do good things. But in reality, it's it doesn't. They just have billions and billions stockpiled in bank accounts, not doing any good works uh, or not as much as they should be doing. So this is blowing my mind that you had to give your money to them and they just automatically took out 10% and more, you're saying. Mm -hmm. Well, and and because we were working for the group, I, I wasn't allowed to work for outside companies. I was only, and I was working from a very young age. So all of my, I just had to trust that I was getting paid, right? Oh so gosh. all the wages are going to this bank account, right? And then um, you'd get this like statement once a month at church. It was like a piece of paper that was really confusing to read. And you were just hoping that they were being honest and paying you. And oh, they, they would talk about like a back account like they made it really confusing and then if if you had a reputation that seemed like you were going to be close to leaving uh, a lot of times all of a sudden pe people that were like falling away from the church or whatever uh randomly would get phone calls that they were in debt <gasps> like oh hey you, you owe us money and they're like well i haven't touched the account in years like they would just make stuff up wow. <laughs> so it's like to have that much control over 
over a person, right? You you literally control everything. You control their job, you control their money, you control even the homes that you own. You don't get to have it in your name. Like 99% of the time, it's under um, the numbered men's name or someone who is over you. You can't have it in your... My own mom was gifted her home because remember, she wasn't born in the order. Yeah. Her dad was on the outside and he gifted her her home. And then the the leadership basically made sure that she signed it over to the leadership so that mm. she couldn't have it in her name. Wow. So it's just a very big way of control. And I know the LDS church doesn't do that. I kind of had a question, though, on for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, didn't they just come out? Because they get 10% from every single member, right? Yeah. So didn't they just come out with like, they're making like seven, what was it? Seven billion dollars a year <laughs> just off of that? Yeah. Is that accurate? I think it was seven billion. And because there was a whistleblower that just came out and he was a investment portfolio manager for Enzyme Peak, one of their major um, like stock holdings bank accounts. And he came out on the news and said, the church has over $100 billion in this bank account and they're not allocating it properly, which means they should be, they should not be a tax exempt company because they are using it to mm-hmm. bail out for profit companies. They're using it for things that they shouldn't be doing. So, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. Billions of dollars, the members don't see any of it. It's their, the members' money and they give it to them and then they invest it. And the funniest thing is one of one of my shelf break items, and we're getting on a tangent, but I think it's very interesting, <laughs> was I found out that they were investing in alcohol companies and all the oh stuff that we gosh. are forbidden to do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how dare you use my tithing money for alcohol, you know? And it's, and it's anything that's profitable. Yeah. Anything that makes them money. Okay. So people are literally stuck in this group, which is why I was watching some episodes of Escaping Polygamy and my jaw was on the floor. I was just like, they can't, they don't have anything. Like, you don't have your own money. You don't know where to live if you mm-hmm. leave. You don't have a support system. You are literally cut off from your own family. I think one of the most heartbreaking scenes that I was watching today was when your brother was leaving and he gets a phone call from your mom and she's just so upset because they're friends and they really love each other. And she's like, why are you doing this? I'm going to miss you. And I think it just really put into perspective how there's just this cycle of abuse that keeps perpetuating because no one really knows how to get off of the wheel. It just mm-hmm. keeps going and going. And you can't blame your mom for what's going on. She's in the system and she doesn't want to stop talking to your brother, but she felt like, well, you know the rules and I have to cut you off now. And that's so sad. Yeah. I remember watching that. I was I was listening to the conversation. They they did cut a part of the scene out mm. where my mom was basically telling him, don't you end up like your sisters where they're not going to church. <gasps> like she's, it's very heavily bra- My mom did, even when we left, she wanted us to become Mormon or something where yeah. we're not falling away from God or whatever. But it is, it's that, that brainwashing and that manipulation. And it's really hard because my brother Eskel, he, I mean, we all go through this phase of they make us feel like we're abandoning them when the reality is right. like we have a choice. We either have to be under your thumb for the rest of our life and live this life of hell or leave and jump out into the unknown, which is yeah. both are scary, right? Yeah. I was one of the first to leave in my family. And so on my seventh, 18th birthday, so I left right before my 18th birthday, I thought, I just didn't think that my family would do that to me. Like, I really thought my family was different, especially because my mom had been on the outside and she also would have a relationship with her sister who was on the outside, a secret relationship. She would she would oh. get to go see her. So I just figured that if I left that I wasn't going to, my family would never do that to me. And I honestly think, I think that that's what helped me leave is this, this like fake reality in my brain that my family's not going to abandon me like that. Oh, right. We're closer than that. But then I left and um, I invited my mom for my 18th birthday because the only people I knew was the people in the group, basically. Yeah. So I invited her to my 18th birthday and she shows up and she, I thought she was going to bring all my siblings. And I was like, where, where are my brothers and sisters? And she pulled me close and she whispered in my ear because there was people around. She didn't want people to know. Like she's aware that it's messed up, I feel like. But she mm-hmm. whispered in my ear. She was like, when you come back to the order, then you can see your siblings again. Mm. And then she gave, she gave me, this was like the worst day of my life when I first left. I thought like every, all 
my my life was ending. She gave me a present, like to to add salt to the wound. I got a present from her and I opened it and it was a photo album that she had been working on um, that was just pictures of all of my siblings. Oh my god! And it was like reinforcing, you will not see them again unless you come back. Ugh. And I'm the second oldest, so I helped raise all of them. So yeah. I'm, I literally spent like two hours in the closet after that in my room, in my little 500 square foot apartment, hmm. bawling my eyes out. <laughs> like I was like, that was so mean. <laughs> that was mean, mom. But, Rude. Yeah. How many siblings do you have again? So my mom had n- 10 kids. Wow. I'm the second oldest. The first wife has 15 kids. Oof. And then I don't know if we want to dive into this part of the the craziness, but my dad ended up marrying a third wife. Uh, well, I think I was like five when he married her, but it ended up being his own half sister. Oh, my gosh. That's mm. so that's another can of worms, right? <laughs> yeah. But so, so that half sister has eight kids with my dad, I believe. So I have like 32 total with all but my mom alone had 10 kids five boys five girls wow that is impressive for all of those women yeah (laughs) you actually helped some of your siblings leave like we just talked about Eskel. so Mm -hmm. i think you're about to go into your relationships with your siblings now yeah also i just before i forget the whole like my mom being mean like coming to my birthday to me Compared to when I see my friends, other friends that have left and how their family really did cut them off completely, I was grateful that my mom still did reach out to me. Because after a while, I was like, dang, like she could have just completely cut me off. Like I have cousins that have left where their mom hasn't seen them since the day they left. Oh, my God. And it's like somehow they can cut off this. I don't know how you can do that as a mother. Right. But they just pretend you're not my kid anymore. (gasps) Which is insane. Oh, my gosh. And I I think it's just shocking, too, that these men can basically make the woman be the sole parent. These these mothers are like single parents. Yeah. And they're providing for these kids. It's not like the FLDS where they can stay home and cook and clean and stay with their kids. They're expected to work. The only ones that stay home, like my mom was lucky enough to get a daycare job where she tended other kids. Like, you have to be making money. So here these men are expecting these wives to... To cook, clean, be a mother, be a full-time, work full-time, bear children at home. And then these women have to just hope to God that their kids don't leave because then they're going to have to cut them off, these kids that they single-handedly raised. Yeah. It's like, of course, it's easier for the men to cut them off. They don't really establish a relationship with their hundreds of kids, Mm -hmm. right? Like the leader has over 300 kids. You think he has a relationship with any of them? (laughs) Wow. Wow. That's insane. And what I was noticing also from that show was that the mothers get blamed when the children decide to leave and escape. I mean, Mm -hmm. literally running in, grabbing your bags and leaving as fast as possible. It's not just like, bye, mom, I want to leave now. You have to plan it and get out of there strategically. And then the mothers are blamed for that. Mm -hmm. I just I can't even imagine what they have to go through. Have you talked to your mom about this? Like, are you close to her at all? So she would still kind of like sneak a relationship with me, but I I wasn't allowed to come home for Christmas. And it was like, it was just very wish-washy because it, when when I left and then I had a, two sisters leave and then you saw my brother leave, that was the last one to leave of my mom's family. So she had four kids leave. Mm-hmm. She was punished for it. So she was taken out of her nice house and put back into her old house. She was demoted to a janitor position. Um, she ended up making, they they demoted her all the way down to making like $7.25 an hour when what? she had six kids that she was still trying to raise. All because now now her like eligible mari- marriage age daughters were gone. So, but yeah, they blame the women. It's crazy though, because it's like when the kids are doing something bad, it's the the mother's fault. But when the kids are doing something good, it's the father. <laughs> it's oh like, my the, gosh. the women do not catch a break. I roll. I know. Even when I was in the group, I was like, I hate hate it here. Like I really thought I must have done something bad in heaven before I was born for God to make me a woman in this place. (laughs) Like, why did he do that to me? Yeah. Were you imagining yourself? I mean, I'm sure that you were, right? Like what's going through your mind when you're a kid and you see your mom being a plural wife and you're like, okay, this is my future. Were you just planning on that? Or from the beginning, were you like, I'm never going to do that? When I was like in 
the private school, like the elementary school, me and my friends would talk about, what if we were sister wives? But this is before you get the hormones and you actually like, you know, me and my friends were excited to be sister wives until I started getting hormones and actually liking liking boys. somebody. Exactly. And then um, I think I was like 14, me and my older sister, Cammie, we pinky swore that we would never marry the same guy because we saw how my mom and her sister were. And oh, we, me my and my gosh. sister, Cammie, wanted to stay friends. And we knew that if we married the same guy, we were not going to stay friends. <laughs> Cause, and I thank God that my mom was so honest because there were a lot of moms that just lied to their kids and said that they're so happy living polygamy. They're not. Mm. They're and and if they think that they are, that's all that they know. They don't know that they could get anything better. It's like yeah. when you're in abusive you you've seen this probably even on the outside, people in abusive relationships that think that they can't get anything better, yeah. so they're grateful for what they have. Yeah. My mom was very honest and was like, if you live polygamy, please just be a first wife. It is I saw her cry Aww. over and over and over like her kids were her best friends which I think was also why it was so hard for her to let us go because she didn't she wasn't friends with her sister her sister was her older sister who I feel like there was always competition and there there I don't care what anyone says there's always a favorite wife sometimes it circle circulates yeah sometimes it bounces around but I saw my mom get really upset and frustrated with my dad and he would just leave to go to the other wife's house like Mm. they're just like alone in the world. So I'm grateful to watch that though, because then when I got older, sorry to cut to answer your question. It's like, it's not black and white. It's not like I knew I was never going to live it. It was like a progression. Right. And then at the age of 15, I did have a really somewhat of a relationship with God. And I, I, I had this guilt, like, if I leave, am I going to go to hell? And Mm. I was like, pray, I ran away and I brought my Bible and I was praying about it. But I basically had this like aha moment That I was like, I think that they're wrong. (laughs) I'm pretty sure if the FLDS thinks that they're true, the LDS church thinks that they're the true church, what makes us right? What makes them right? I I don't want to talk too much about that experience because it's probably boring. But basically, I came to this conclusion as I had run away at 15 is I was like, I think that I'm going to like I I know what my future is here in the order. I'm going to have to marry my first cousin. Like I'm going to have to be a polygamist and I'm going to have to have kids with him. I don't know what my future is on the outside. And that is scary, but I'd rather not know than live this and and know how it's going to (laughs) end. And then the thought of having daughters and and sons and raising them in that, I just couldn't imagine having a daughter and being like, this is what you have to do now. You know, I couldn't do that to them. Yeah. So I knew at 15 I was going to leave. I just had no idea how. (laughs) Did they ever put you in a position or did they ever court you when you were younger because you left when you were pretty young right or no you were 17 or 18 when you left mm-hmm. I mean I I had run away a few times but yeah 17 it finally stuck and I I got to get out but they did I knew who I was supposed to marry really yeah it was my first cousin oh yeah even closer so his mom is my dad's full sister and his dad is my dad's half brothers meaning his mom and dad are half siblings so i'm related very close to them because oh my gosh if you, sorry this is going to confuse you but if your parents are half siblings that means your dad is your uncle right because your your yeah. mom's brother is your uncle right <laughs> so that means your parents are your aunt and uncle <laughs> oh my gosh. so oh my basically gosh. if i had kids with him i'd have kids with like 12 toes or whatever like that would have not <laughs> been a good thing so yeah. thank God I got out before any of that. But I was like, I'd rather die. than. And I even told him, like, he, he, they have this process when someone's supposed to be, you know, getting engaged or whatever. The guy has to get the approval of the parents and the leader and whatever. And then he's able to basically kind of take you on a date. But it's like, it's called them coming forward, which uh-huh. is such weird verbiage. But like, they're going to come forward on you. <laughs> so he got the okay to come forward. And he picked me up and he took me to Panda Express. <laughs> and he was like wearing a tie. Oh my and um, I know it was so weird, but then I, t- I just was so honest. And this is what got me in so much trouble in the group is because I was so honest. And I just told him to his face. I was like, first of all, I don't believe in polygamy. And second of all, you are my cousin. Yeah. And he laughed. He thought I was joking. And I was like, I'm not joking. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because it's... When you're surrounded with the crazy, then someone who's not saying that I was like the most sane person, but someone who's talking sane will sound insane because you're surrounded by the insane. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Especially when you're so isolated within the group and you Mm -hmm. 
had to did you have to go to specific schools that were only within your group too? like how I think someone you know what? let me go to my phone here because someone had a question and I'd rather just read it was there a lot of questions girl <laughs> there's so many questions <laughs> oh, I'm excited to hear them so many questions how much was the information about the outside world restricted and how anti-education was the FLDS which I know technically isn't your um, specific sect, but you know, we get the idea. Mm -hmm. As we have seen with other such organizations, they tend to tightly control access to information about the outside world and only prefer their members to educate themselves at approved institutions, often which only contain members from said organization, both staff and students. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, I think FLDS and the order is kind of similar in that aspect where they did have the private schools. They didn't want them to go to public schools, but there were in both groups, there were people who were lucky enough to go to public school, whether it was like for me, it was that the junior high wasn't built yet. And so my mom made the decision of instead of having me go to homeschool, I was allowed to go to junior high public school for two years, which I think that is a big reason why I was more sane, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's because it's not like I just knew that all this stuff was weird. Like you're not born with that. If you, whatever you're born into, that's what you're born that's into. You normal. know, like if the yeah. sky, if everyone around, yeah, exactly. If everyone tells you the sky's purple, this guy's purple. Like yeah. how are you supposed to know it's blue? So I am grateful that I did get two years of public school. But yeah, I think that in a lot of these groups, that's why, that's how the, the members are born there and they die there because they don't know anything more just like mm -hmm. the people in these in the in the you know you save your first kiss for your wedding date that is the only person you've ever had a relationship with so you don't know that there's better out there yeah. so you stay in your tiny little world people on the outside do it too though i think there's a statistic that it's like 65 percent of people never leave the hometown they were born in People wow. on the outside. That's a big I think number. it's a comfort thing. Yeah. Yeah. People are scared to go out of their comfort zone. And it's ever since I left, I'm scared that I I I think people put a roof on their progression on their progression because of the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has been something that scares me. Like, am I doing that right now? <laughs> am I falling back into the ways of the brainwashed order? Right. And it's something that you really have to put attention towards. And that's the consciousness part of the podcast is you have to be aware. You have to be able to actually observe yourself and observe others from new perspectives mm -hmm. to see if what's going on is normal or if it's programming or whatever it is, it's hard to know. And here's a question that I have from Alexandria. Um, she says, I've heard of the Kingstons. I'd like to know what shocked her the most about the world when she left. So what was what were some of the things like when you got into the outside world, you're like, oh, this is very different than what I thought the world was. I didn't think that I was as weird. <laughs> I got a lot of people looking at me weird when I would talk about my life or I would, I would share too much or I would be too honest. And then I had a really hard time I I I still think I have a hard time making friends because I didn't understand the social norms but mm. I thought I was fine because I went to public school for two years and I was very in the group I was very very social um but then when I left I was like I thought I was an introvert I thought I just didn't like to be around people but it was really because like I I felt so fish out of water like I didn't fit in I didn't fit in in the cult and I don't fit in out here I don't know where I belong it was like really depressing so I I clung to I the person I ended up marrying at 18 I clung to him because hmm. I didn't know how to how to evolve out here and I that's that was the major shock I honestly like there were some things like people with a lot of tattoos scared me people with, who smoked cigarettes kind of scared me but um I think the the most scary thing was like how I thought this was gonna be easier than this yeah. <laughs> like getting jobs making friends it was way harder to function in society than I thought and then I think therapy helped with that mm. doing a lot of therapy helped to finally be like okay, you need to be more comfortable in your skin. And the problem was we were, I think one of the major problem was we were taught to lie so much in the order. A lot of ex-members will say this. They had to like train themselves not to lie because we were taught to lie to outsiders. Oh, for the good. Exactly. When, when I went to public school, they were, they told me to tell them I was a Christian, like have this whole lie to tell your friends so that no one knows that your family's living polygamy. Oh my so gosh. So I would catch myself lying when I was on the outside. I was like, I don't know why I'm lying, <laughs> but I'm still lying. <laughs> 
Yeah. So it took a while to to retrain my brain to stop being a liar. <laughs> Sounds so bad, but it's like... No, it makes total sense because it's a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Because in your mind, your survival depended on lying to the outside world so that your inner world wouldn't come crashing down on you. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious because you were kind of injected into regular society, at least a little bit, like you weren't behind any walls, right? Like you were able to go out in the outside world. So did you have that really uh, black and white opinion of us versus them? We have it right. The outside world is doing stuff wrong. Like, what was your opinion about society? When I was younger, I definitely thought, you know, we are the chosen ones going to heaven. And yeah. I remember having a dilemma with, because when I did start to develop relationships and friendships with outsiders, I was like, I remember crying, being like, wow, they're not going to make it to the celestial kingdom. Mm. Like, they don't get to have this. Yeah. And then um, even like wanting to... I, I had a crush on an outside boy and I remember having a conversation with my dad, like, is it possible that they could ever join? And he laughed. He's like, no, 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 no. You will, who you are going to marry is already in the order, basically. Oh, really? Oh, that makes sense. Because the whole point, and I would love to get your opinion on this too, especially when you go deeper into the polygamy part, but the whole point was to keep the bloodline pure. And pure. so, yep. so there was no room for missionary work. But I didn't know this as a kid. Oh, no, no, no. And that's the the thing, too. Like, of course, they'll take women. If if women, like, let's say, wanted to join from the FLDS, they need women. So I, mm. I think they would happily take them. Even when women leave and men leave, they're more willing to have a woman come back because they're more valuable. Like, I, I've seen this. But, like, as far as, like... um that whole experience with being a kid and like and at first I did think that we were better than outsiders it does create narcissism I really think it does yeah. cults create narcissism we're, we're the sure. best we're better than you <laughs> but I'm glad that I got to have relationships with outsiders because it made me sympathize like cry about like why can't they come to heaven with me they're really good people and then I started to be like you yeah. know what they're better people than I am like what makes me better than them just because I was born here that doesn't make any sense mm-hmm so yeah. then, it, then it started to turn and be like, once I got older, I was like, I don't believe in that. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of things that I didn't realize I was still brainwashed when I left that I had to unravel. But as far yeah. as your question, yeah, it was black and white when I was younger. And then when I got older, I was like, it's not that simple. <laughs> right. And I would love to just give everyone a, a simple idea or a deep idea, however deep you want to go into it, as far as what the actual rules were for the group. Mm -hmm. So at least for myself in mainstream Mormonism, it's the word of wisdom, right? Which is no drinking, no smoking, no coffee, no drugs, any of that, no tattoos, which is funny because they recently kind of reversed that, which I'm laughing about. But um, what do you mean, like the tattoo one? Yeah. So they just came out in general conference. I think it was this April or this year saying, well, they took out the part of no tattoos and no multiple ear piercings, I believe. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, guys, but I'm pretty sure it was a big deal that they didn't necessarily say go get tattoos, but they took it out saying it's okay if you have them. And everyone was just shocked. <laughs> so so you can you can go to the temple then if, you, if you're getting tattoos? I think so. Because I started to see a wow. bunch of memes circulating with the prophet getting a tattoo. <laughs> I just thought it was oh. really funny. <laughs> but... So this I know was recent? That, yeah, it was recent. So they're starting to get more lax. And because you're part of a more fundamentalist group, I was just wondering how strict those rules were, if they were the same rules as mainstream Mormonism, but just amped up, or if you had additional rules. Yeah, we definitely, I mean, we had all, we had all the same rules, but then obviously like on steroids. <laughs> mm. I like to look at it as we were like old old time LDS yeah. where we kept the racism and we kept the, <laughs> we mm. definitely believe, they still believe uh, not mixing your race. Wow. Um, they they think even outsiders shouldn't be doing that, that that's a sin. And they, they believe in the whole, so sorry, I'll start with the racism thing because that one just boils my blood. Yeah. They believe in, and I think this comes from Joseph Smith or Brigham Young, but they believe in the whole war in heaven. Do you remember this yes, story? Yes, sure do. We talked yep. about it with Calvin. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's such a staple for these polygamists. And again, this is a, to, to circle back narcissism, right? You yeah. have to just believe that you're better than someone else for literally the color of their skin. They don't care what it is. They want to be better. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole war in heaven is like basically for anyone who doesn't know, the war in heaven is we white people. When there was a war in heaven, there was Jesus against Satan kind of thing, and Jesus chose free agency, Satan chose to force whatever. But us white people chose Jesus' side, and then the demons of hell chose Satan's side, and then there was the fence sitters who couldn't decide, and they were born on this earth as you know, black, brown, um, basically anyone with too dark of skin, mm-hmm. I guess, for the order. Anyone who's liking. not white, yeah. Those people are not going to get a chance to even go to heaven. I remember having a fight with my dad. Like, so what's the point of them even being born on this earth then? And he's like, I don't know. They're just going to go to hell. Wait. (laughs) Okay. That's a distinction because, because, well, at least they say that in mainstream Mormonism, they've relinquished all racism, but it's still in the doctrine. I digress. Um, So you guys believed that no matter what, even if you were... Uh, baptized and did all the right things and went to the temple you still couldn't go to heaven if you were black that's what okay that's what i was taught Uh i don't know if they're changing it now because i did have a fight with one of the members after i had left and they were like saying oh we would allow a black person to join they just couldn't get married and they would have to pay a fee to join or whatever wait they'd have to pay a fee amanda (laughs) Yeah, there's a fee to join. No. Why would you want to join? There's nothing that entices <laughs> anyone to want to join. Maybe that's why. I mean, maybe some men they're like, ooh. Maybe that's why they do it because they want they don't want people to join, and so they make it really difficult and obviously unattractive, so that they don't have. I mean, it sounds like the way the mainstream Mormonism treats gay people. Like, no, 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 you can be gay, you can join, you mm-hmm. just can't be gay, you just can't act on it. Yeah, you can't act on it. You can't like you're just gonna have to be alone forever, <laughs> basically. Wow. Yeah. But so, yeah, to clarify, I know that maybe some order members will be like, hey, that's not true. Or I wasn't taught that. I personally was taught that anyone with the dark skin that were the fence sitters mm-hmm. are the ones that are not going to get the chance to go to heaven. And I, I remember having that thought, like, what's the point of them even being born? Then, right. If they're no, that makes sense. God, it's weird. <laughs> it's so weird. I just I was just hearing something. It was on Myth Vision. Um Bryce from Naked Mormonism, which we're, we're going to have him on soon, but he was talking about this woman, and I feel awful that I forgot her name, but she was a black woman in Joseph Smith's time, and they were good friends, whatever, and that's another thing they try and say is, we're, we're not racist. Joseph Smith loved black people. I'm like, okay. So he said to her, okay, you can you can go to the celestial kingdom. You can be sealed to me, right? Because what an honor and privilege to be sealed to me as one of my celestial wives, but you will be a slave in the afterlife. I kid you not. Joseph Smith? Joseph that? Smith sealed a black woman to him to be his to be his eternal slave. Wow. So that would make so much sense as to where that came from in your group mm-hmm. because it was directly from the prophet. Wow. I did hear that that there was a ceiling with Joseph Smith, but I didn't know that that was the context of it. That is insane. Why would they want to be sealed? I don't know. I don't know. Because what <laughs> an honor. Insane. What an honor, right? And that is I, so I have to get... Okay, well, we're going all over the place. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about aside from the racism that... You just absolutely hate it as far as rules go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, with the rules, I'll, I'll brush across most of them, but that one is one of the the staples. And I feel like all polygamous groups can, can agree that that is one of the staples. Like, that's why most polygamous groups, especially in Utah, all of them, they're all white mm-hmm. people. So they're all still that staple of racism, the staple of consecration, right? Consecrating your all to the Lord. And then polygamy, which a lot of them believe you have to have three wives to get into the celestial kingdom. That was like the number. Oh. And then as far as the order goes is the the bloodline thing, right? You keep that bloodline pure because we are direct descendants of Christ, which I think other other polygamous groups believe that same thing. Okay. And then um, keep yourself pure, right? As a woman, you have to like... You have to, we have these ABC order standards that we had to memorize in our school, Sunday school and in our private school, where like A is for appreciation, I appreciate my life, K is for kiss, I will save my first kiss for my wedding day for my husband or wife. So we were not allowed to kiss. Holding hands was allowed if you were engaged, but your first kiss is for your wedding day. So it's very like, it's a big no-no if you're dating. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's the main course of the rules obviously like once you're married like tie into your husband the chain of command and make sure i mean obviously the same same rules as the lds too like being gay is definitely 
they, I mean, I remember people in the order thinking that it was just made up. Being gay was just made Wait. up for attention. That's what, Seriously? that's a quote that my dad said. <laughs> oh my God. Because yeah, I have a half brother who, who w- knew he was gay from a very young age. And when my dad started to find out that they, it caused like all hell broke loose. It caused, um, my dad to just basically lash out on him and be like, you're making up for attention. The first wife, so his mom was like crying, like, oh, it's because I ate eggs when I was pregnant <gasps> with you and it gave you too much estrogen. Are you I don't, it's like, me? and then my brother's just sitting there like thinking he's like this broken product. Oh, and so that was no. like, yeah, I feel like it's like the order just lives like centuries in the past. <laughs> oh, for sure. I always joke that Mormonism is 50 years behind its time. I guess the fundamentalism would be literally when it was created behind its time. So 1840s, Mm -hmm. 50s, when Mormonism started. (laughs) Yep. When women weren't allowed to vote. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. That's how they liked it. So, I I mean, it would make sense that if one of the men came out as gay, it would probably be the perfect reason to just throw him out since there is too many men, right? Or they don't want all of the men because of the competition with the other women? Is, is that a thing? Yeah, but if the gay man is one of Paul's close sons, then I've, I've seen it where they just marry them off to multiple women and oh, they just wow. have them have kids. And I've heard, I've never seen it, but I've heard that there was these things called con- conversion therapy. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's at their clinic because they own a clinic and they have a doctor that works for them. Um, I... I don't know what exactly happens at conversion therapy, but they do make some of the married men that have come out as gay go to conversion therapy. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, no openly gay stuff going on in there. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. What about the women who come out as gay? I've heard there's some, like, hush-hush stuff going on with that, but... This is going to get kind of gross. Give it to me. Yeah. There's no secret. These men, you think that they're not having threesomes, foursomes. They are. Mm. And they, they... it came out even when I was in the group that they were making their wives do it. Some of the wives didn't want to do it. Oh, no. And so I'm hearing, yeah, I'm hearing that. Well, because some of the wives, too, are sisters, Oh, too. no. No, Amanda. I know. <laughs> I know. You said you wanted to hear it. I so did. I'm, yeah, I'm did telling you. Lay it on. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as far as, like, the girls coming out as gay, I think it's not as big of a deal because they just join these these – these polygamous marriages and they're kind of allowed to do those things as long as it's with their husband oh my isn't that crazy that's just what i'm hearing that's what i'm hearing i obviously never joined a polygamous relationship but yeah i mean it was talked about even when i was in the group it's not a secret like what if there's two sister wives can they get down with each other if the husband's not there i mean i don't know i'm sure it's happened i guarantee you it's happened there's no way it's like within marriage right. technically right so but i've never heard of that but i i guarantee you it's happened like especially when some of these men have like 10 plus wives i'm sure these women get lonely oh my god <laughs> so then they befriend each other i don't know i'm sure it's happened in other groups too do they just keep them all separate in separate houses? Yeah, that's the difference with with my group, Calvin's group, and the FLDS. So those groups, they all are in one home, uh-huh. which I don't know how they're not like fist fights amongst right. the families. But our group, it, I rarely ever saw a family all together in one home. Like my mom always had her own home, and then the first I've had her home separate, and it was like miles away. Like it's not like even in the same neighborhood. Mm-hmm. But I always wondered why we did it like that, but I honestly think that the Kingstons really like owning a lot of properties, so they do like if like their members can somehow like go out and get a loan and be responsible for that loan on that home, and then they give up that home to the to the church. Mm. So I think it benefits them that they have multiple properties, but I also think there would be a lot of fights if they all were in one home. Right. Plus, I do think. Because the Kingstons are all about like lying to the outside and not being. I know FLDS. I've I've talked to some of my FLDS friends where they were like proud to be polygamous and they would wear their dresses. Yeah, we were taught to lie, and I think that that whole like having separate households kind of is another thing to like pretend that we're just single family home. You know, mm. especially yeah. when you're living in the Salt Lake City. Yeah, I mean it's a big city, um, mm. which is also really surprising that you're able to kind of slip under the radar while these horrific things are happening in a big city because it makes sense colorado Mm -hmm. springs is it springs i always say it wrong city or springs 
Colorado City. Okay, <laughs> so I said it wrong. So in Colorado City, it makes sense because they're literally behind walls and they're in their own community. But mm-hmm. to be in Salt Lake and to still fly under the radar, in fact, that was someone's question. And I want to bring it up now. Um, so people are wondering about how you're able to help these people who are in cults if you can't tell that they're in a cult. Are they asking because they want to be able to help? Mm-hmm. I think that's definitely hard because even if they're, you can identify that they're in a cult, how do you know they're in a place to be able to leave, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's definitely a mental thing. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Took me forever. So this comment was from KK and they said, how can non-cult people recognize someone in a cult who may need help but dresses in street clothes so they blend in? Are there signs to look out for? And how can we help girls and women in course of groups who need help escaping? Yeah, that's a hard one because even if you like if you go to St. George, you see people in in their FLDS dresses everywhere. Yeah. So but just because they're walking around in FLDS dress doesn't mean that they want you to come be like, hey, come here, let me help you. Yeah. You know? So I think that's a that's that's a hard answer because I think that the um only thing that I can really say is like just making sure that that information's available. That's why like on all of my YouTube videos, I make sure that the information for holding out help is available. Because a lot of them, like I was saying, like a lot of them don't know that there are options out here. Even when I was in the group, I had to like dig to find out that there was people out here that were going to help me. Right. Because they don't want you to have that information. So I guess like I've thought about this, though, like um, because I have run into randomly run into people with their FLDS dresses and people from the order, my own family. And I've thought about just having like a business card and like right. slipping it to them. But like, I guarantee you, sometimes they would like throw it back at me because they're offended <laughs> because I'm this like demon trying to bring them to Satan. Yeah. So that's a hard answer. Like, like, even if you were to identify them, you don't know if they're going to be like, thank you for this information, right. you know, but sometimes I feel like it's better to just tell them and then have them spit on you and be like, well, OK, well, now you have that information. You're welcome. <laughs> That's such a good point. Because I did point. that as a kid. Well, I, I remember being like, oh, I can't believe these people are, are leaving the order and then talking about it and da, da, da. And then I get older and I'm like, I'm grateful that they're doing that. Yeah. But I didn't uh, know how to appreciate it at the time when I was brainwashed. So that's a tricky question. I don't know if I answered it in the best way, but I guess just to be able to share information with them if you can identify them. With the order, it's really hard to identify them. I feel like you have to be one of them or around them a lot to be able to recognize their mannerisms hmm. there there are they do have recognizable mannerisms and um if you've watched the show a lot of people say that the kingstons have a look to us we right. all look very similar so i think that's how i identify there's there's a certain way that a lot of the families walk really and i can tell like oh yeah like what like they, recently i saw one in vegas just like I'm trying to put words to the to the thoughts of it. It's like uh, the way that they walk in their mannerisms is they don't want to be associated with. It's not that they're insecure and they're like putting their head down like they're so insecure, but it's more like they keep to themselves. Like I've I've literally had times where I'm walking through the gym in Utah and I see in the corner of my eye someone on the treadmill. I'm like, that is an order member <gasps> in the corner of my eye. Wow. By the way, it's so hard to explain, but it's basically like they have this mannerism, this way of walking, this way that they present themselves to the public That's it's just like natural, I guess, because like we are not in our comfort zone when we're out in the public. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'm butchering the way of saying that, but I don't know that an outsider could fully um, recognize them unless they really studied them. Yeah. If that makes sense. It totally Whereas makes FLDS sense. is like, oh, they wear the dress. Right. <laughs> the it's <end. laughs> very easily recognizable in like this pilgrim dress. But no, I totally get it because I've been on planes before and I'll hear and see Mormons like the accent and the way they dress. And I tell my friends, I'm like, they're Mormon. Mm-hmm. And they're like, how do you know? Yeah. And then later you'll hear them talking about it. And I'm like, you just, you know, when you know. <laughs> yep. And there is, there is a way that they talk to. I've even been asked, like, do you have an accent? I feel like I don't still talk like I did in the group, but I guess I still have some remnants of an accent. <laughs> do I sound like I have an accent? Girl, I don't know, because I'm from Utah. And when I moved, everyone 100% was like, why do you have an accent? I'm like, no, I don't. But I think I think Utah in general has maybe it's a, a Utah yeah, accent. Utah mm-hmm. has a very distinct mm-hmm. accent, and the the vowels are kind of lazy, and we don't pronounce our T's like in mountain. 
it's a mountain <laughs> it's mountain like, fountain mountain. yeah did you guys say um honry oh yeah yeah i i when i moved to vegas and i started working in vegas i used the word honry and they're like what the hell does same, that mean i'm like same. what <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's a utah thing i don't know wait when did you live in vegas after i got my divorce february march 2021 I moved to Henderson. <laughs> okay, because I lived in Henderson as well. And there's a huge population of Mormons there, which most people don't know. I know. But yeah, I lived there 2008 to 2011. So I was hoping we may have crossed paths. That would have been cool, but guess not. Henderson, though. Yeah, Henderson. That's a, It's an interesting area. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you know what? While we're on the topic of Vegas, I actually did get a question about uh, the Sister Wife show. And okay, so Classy says, I heard the sister wives were from this group or some of them. What are your thoughts on mainstream TV trying to glamorize this lifestyle and now the complete downfall of their quote family? I remember when Sister Wives came out and my dad was really like into watching it. And really? I hated watching it because one, they were lying. And also sister wives, I remember they were saying that they were an independent polygamous, like they just randomly decided to live polygamy. Yeah. No, they're from the AUB group, the one in Bluffdale. Oh, they're not from the order, right? but they're from the the Bluffdale group, which is like the Jessups, and I think a lot of Allreds are over there. But so one, I hated that they were lying. And so like once once you lie about one thing, what else are you lying about? Mm. So I was like guaranteed that they were putting on a show. Mm. It was just a show. Kind of like 19 Kids and Counting. It's just a show for the cameras to make money. And you see it. On, I'm so glad it's unraveling now, right? Like it's so obvious that Cody Brown's a narcissist. <laughs> I think he knows <laughs> I don't like him. I've run into him a few times. Oh like my gosh. Uh, he was at a rally. Yeah, I was on the anti-polygamy side. He was on the pro-polygamy side. But like that show got so many views. And it got a lot of people supporting polygamy. I remember a lot of people being like, well, if gay people can get legally married, then polygamists should get legally married too. They're putting it in the same category. Mm. And I'm like, that is not. So you're saying that two people who are gay and love each other getting married is in the same category as teenagers marrying their uncles and like all. Right. The, have you heard that they they outlawed polygamy in Canada because they could not find a single case of polygamy where there wasn't like abuse, underage really? marriages or incest? It makes sense. So it's not like t two gay people that love each other. Don't yeah. put it in the same category. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think Cody Brown's show really, at the time that it was like all big, then it really made people be like, well, who cares if they're living polygamy? And then it wasn't that big of a deal. But now people are realizing, oh, polygamy is not... Because who in their right mind as a woman would say, yes, I want to be loyal to my husband as he's looking around for more... And put anyone, anyone could be his next wife, even my own sister. Oh my and I gosh. just have to stay loyal and hope that I can get my place in heaven while I'm dying inside. Like, I don't know. I don't know how a lot of people thought, well, if it's their choice, it's their choice. I don't know a single person who truly is happy living it. Like, truly happy. The whole their choice thing, it's like, mm, I don't know about that. Pretty sure they were coerced into believing that it was their choice, but mm -hmm. it really wasn't. I mean, do you know any independent polygamists? <laughs> I don't know any. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have, to, I have to be honest and say, even when I was living in Utah, completely obli oblivious to the fact that polygamy was still going on. Had no idea. I mean, also, I grew up in Tremont Inn, which I... <laughs> I died laughing. So I think it was the very first episode of Escaping Polygamy and or maybe the second episode. And they're like, the girls went to this tiny town three hours away. And then it was like at the bottom said Tremont in Utah. And I just died laughing because that's where I grew up. You're like, that's my and town. I was like, yeah. <laughs> they're like, they came here because it's in the middle of nowhere and no one would follow them. I'm like, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> it's like middle also, of nowhere. they were in your own town. Yeah. Right under your nose. Wait, do you know of people practicing polygamy in Tremont? In? I think they were referencing the FLDS, right? Or was it the AUB? I don't remember. In that I episode. think I think they just met someone there because it was so far out of the way that they didn't think they would be followed. But I don't know if polygamy actually happens in Tremont. In. I mean, it's so small. No, I think that there might be a couple order families out there, actually. <gasps> no. I think I know what episode you're talking about now. Really? Yeah, but it's not like there's a whole branch of them. I think it's just because there's, is there a lot of farmland out there? So much. Okay, yeah. We, the order has a lot of like random farms everywhere, like Ibapa. Like they have a lot of random little farms everywhere. So I would imagine that there's probably a few order families. I'm pretty sure in Tremont. Oh, I'm pretty my sure gosh. it's Paul's family too. 
Do you know the last name? Yeah. Would it be Kingston? The last name? Are they all Kingston? Well, was one of them Knight? Last name Knight? I don't know any Knights, but doesn't mean they don't exist over there. I'm just, it would blow my mind if you told me someone that I knew that happened to be in a polygamous family and I just had no idea. I would just like go crazy. I mean, maybe. <laughs> what, is there like one main school that's out there? Yeah, it's Bear River High School. It's like the only one. Oh my gosh, I think that there might have been some. I'm going to have to do my research and get back to you on that because you might have known some. Get back to me and I will flip through my yearbooks <laughs> and we will get on and talk about it. <laughs> We'll bring them on. Yes. Wow. Okay. We've already been going for so long and we haven't even scratched the surface, but I love this because <laughs> we, I've been able to ask you all of the questions that I wanted to ask selfishly. We didn't really get into the topic. So this is what I'm thinking. We do another episode where we specifically only talk about coercive polygamy mm-hmm. and incestuous polygamy. Are you down? Yeah. Because okay. I think that that's the main thing that sets the order apart. And not a lot of people talk about how incest the order is, for sure. And then obviously all these polygamous groups, that's an issue, the forced polygamy on these women. Yes. So that's something that definitely needs to be talked about, for sure. Okay, perfect. To close out this episode, I need to get your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement as the viral video with the toddler goes. Anything you want to say to someone who's pissed you off or if you have an inspirational statement for our listeners and viewers. Do you get a lot of people doing sassy? Not sassy very stuff? many. I would love a sassy. <laughs> okay. It's been a while since I've had a sassy. Huh. I'll have to think of one. But I, all I can think of it that, that's important to be saying is I know there's going to be a lot of people that are watching that are from FLDS or from the order or from the AUB. And a lot of them don't know about holding out help. And I mm. always, is it possible we could leave the link to holding out help in the description box? Absolutely. Down below? Yes. Yeah. Holding out help is a, um, they helped me when I first left the order and they, are they they give housing to people who are in need who are leaving polygamous relationship because a lot of us don't have anywhere to go so if you are someone who is needing um therapy or a place to go or just uh, to be able to get away from the abusive polygamous relationship that you're in um holding out help has a hotline phone number that you can call and get more information and even if you just want to call just to know what the resources are yeah then that information is always it's always in my description box in my videos and then it will be in this one is this your puppy <laughs> this is oscar he just decided to pop Aww. in and give his support too <laughs> he's usually on my lap Aww. and you can't see him but he jumped down earlier um Okay, so Linda, listen, there are resources for you. There is help for you. And we will put it in the the link below. And Oscar is giving, look at him. He jumps up. He's like, I agree with this statement. Um, And we're going to get your sassy Linda listen in the next episode. (laughs) So do you have any final thoughts before we go and plug all your channels? The The best advice I have in my 27 years of life is to just follow your heart and um, try to find yourself, whatever that is, and be true to yourself, whatever that may be, as long as it's not hurting anybody. (laughs) Yes, I love that so much. And everyone go check out Amanda Ray's channel. Your at is Amanda Loves Rachel, if I'm remembering correctly. I know. I didn't know that it was going to, you know how they changed the YouTube Uh to, to where your handle is? So I would have changed it, but it's Amanda loves Rachel, yeah, because <laughs> because Rachel is my younger sister. Oh, that's but, so yeah. sweet. <laughs> it's the e- email, I guess, that was on it. But oh, yeah, if you so go sweet. to just Amanda Ray, and we we do lives every Sunday called called the Cup of Coffee. If you ever want to join a live too, awesome. And then you can ans- a- ask questions live as well. Cool. Do you want to drop any of your Instagram handles or social media handles? I mean, it's just Amanda Ray Grant on Instagram. That's probably the most active one. I mean, I do have a Twitter, but it's not as active. I would say YouTube, if you're ever wanting to ask questions, YouTube lives is a pretty good way to do it. And then Instagram, if you message me, I, I may respond. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> no hard. Promises. You have Instagram too, right? It's yeah. hard to be able to respond on there. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. We are going to record another episode specifically on polygamy and how it's coercive and everything that goes into that. So stick around. And if you want to support the podcast, it would mean the world if you could become a patron. Thank you so much to my new patrons, Andy, Connie, Paige, Eleanor, Ray, Quaid, Lyra, and Jamie. Thank you so much for joining. And if you liked this episode, guys, make sure to check out, let's see, which one do we want to put? Let's just say the one with Jude. I'll put it down below, Jude part one, and then maybe I'll put Jude part two over here. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.